Climate, Jobs, Justice. It's a coalition of 350 Maine and the Sierra Club and the Poor People's Campaign and Maine Conservation Voters and a host of others. Uh, and we are one of about 400 marches this day around the world. We're giving our march a local flavor. It's focused on the warming Gulf of Maine. And as you can see, we are honoring the noble codfish. Those of you can, who can attend will hear youth speakers and a eulogy to the codfish on the steps of City Hall. So all of this looks ahead to what's going to happen in five days in California and what's going to happen in less than two months with the midterm elections. It is a 400 action worldwide reaction to Trump's pulling out of the Paris Climate Accord. When governors and mayors and business leaders meet in California in five days, we expect they will be announcing more of their own carbon dioxide cuts. And all of us can do our bit by working locally, because the sooner the world goes to 100% clean renewable energy, the safer we'll be. Thank you. that accompanied us here today with the leftist marching band and the ideal Maine social and sanctuary band. And as we all know, when something like this happens, it's not just the day of the event. There's a little bit that happens behind the scenes as we lead up to the event, and that's um, a whole bunch of folks working together. And we had an amazing group of partners and organizations standing together united so that we can get this job done and I want to give a big shout out to everyone that made today happy, happen. So I want to thank 350 Maine, Maine Conservation Voters, Sierra Club Maine, the Poor People's Campaign, Mainers for Accountable Leadership, Peace Action Maine, League of Women's Voters, Portland and Scarborough Climate Action Teams, Democratic Socialists of America, and the Green Party. And most of the folks have tables set up around here, so please take the time to swing by, see what they're all doing. They're doing all kinds of great stuff throughout our state, and it'd be great for you all to get a little bit more involved, although I know a lot of us are already very involved. And for anyone here that is not yet registered to vote, because we all know how important those midterm elections are going to be, right down the street here on that next corner, the League of Women's Voters actually have registration cards so you can get registered today. So don't forget to make that happen. Vote. <laughs> so another important thing that I think we all need 
to do right now, and I want us to get like crazy loud when I yell the word victory. And that is where, you know, it's a lot of bad news out there right now, right? We're all feeling a little beaten down. But hey, something pretty cool just happened right here in our state, right? After five years of fighting, everyone here in the state, in Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, throughout New England and Canada, when dirty tar sands oil wanted to come through our pipeline and be shipped out to sea to market, we all started banding together and no one stopped working for five years straight. I want to give an especially big shout out to Protect South Portland and the amazing people that never once gave up for five straight years, victory! And that victory is so very, very, very sweet because we just set a precedence that guess what, big oil, you don't get to come into our towns and make them dirty and filthy and make our people sick and our planet sick. We will fight back, victory! because this march was actually a funeral procession, right? Because our Gulf of Maine is really, really sick. Or in fact, our Gulf of Maine is the, one of the warmest waters, warming waters because of climate change around the globe. And so today, as you march the streets, as all of you are well aware, we are honoring the fact that there's a bunch of beautiful creatures out there that are sick and dying. And we want to make sure that we do our part to change the tide there. So I want to call up um, one of the great orchestrators of this vision here today, and he's gonna give a eulogy for that codfish that we carried around, and that's Lee Chisholm of 350 Maine. Well, thank you, fellow mourners. You know, the fishing in the Gulf of Maine used to be second to none, but the herring are disappearing. The shrimp are gone. The lobsters are moving ever northward. And commercial fishing for cod, the cornerstone species of our world-famous fishery, has utterly collapsed. We have borne on this casket, from Lincoln Park to these steps of City Hall, a large and noble codfish. He is unnamed because unknown unappreciated because unseen. But let us honor his life and memory today by giving thought to his plight. He is, after all, one of us. I shall call this codfish Sam. Sam was our near neighbor, born and brought up in the Gulf of Maine. His family called these waters their home for thousands of years. Like them, he was a good, decent, honest fellow. Oh, he had his faults. He could be lazy. He could be gluttonous. But nobody would call him mean-spirited. When we humans sought him out with hooks on lines, he didn't complain. When we dammed Maine's rivers, where the alewives and shad were wont to spawn and some of his favorite foods consequently grew scarce, he didn't complain. When we discovered ever bigger, better ways to catch him, from long lines to gill nets and draggers, from fish finders to factory ships, he didn't complain. But when we began to heat up his beloved Gulf of Maine through ceaseless combustion of coal and oil and gasoline and natural gas, when the Gulf of Maine's waters started to increase in temperature faster than 99% of the world's ocean bodies, when Sam, a cold water loving fish down to his very bones, just could not seem to catch a break, he uttered what some might call a complaint. These were his dying words. For 
God's sake. For God's and your children's sake. S-T-O-P. Cut the carbon. To the honored memory of Sam Codfish, then, let us sing. Some of you will know this song from the famous English composer Benjamin Britten. I shall sing a line. Please try to sing it back. This is all experimental. <laughs> Old Sam the Cod is dead and gone. Old Sam the Cod is dead and gone. You'll never see him more. You'll never see him more. He used to love the Gulf of Maine. He used to love the Gulf of Maine. But that was long before. But that was long before. Once through with me. Old Sam the Cod is dead and gone. You'll never see him more. He used to love the Gulf of Maine, but that was long before. We'll remember you, Sam Cod. We will not forget you when this day, November 6, comes in the midterm elections. Thank you, everybody. So much like the preachers out there in the Gulf of Maine, they don't get to vote. We're about to introduce a whole string of super amazing, powerful speakers who yet can't vote, but believe me, their voice is rising. It is my honor to introduce the first speaker, Lucia Durrani, a junior at Casco Bay High School. Lucia. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for coming out. I'm so honored to be the first speaker of all of these amazing people. Everyone who I marched with is just so inspiring. Um, today, I'm here to address the issue of ocean acidification in the Gulf of Maine. I've been lucky enough to grow up on Peaks Island, Maine, which is just off the coast of Portland. And so I've seen firsthand how the shellfish are being affected by ocean acidification. Excess CO2 has found its way into our oceans and is now messing with the pH levels. Um, because of this, we will see a, do, a lack of natural resources for the shellfish to build their shells and grow. This will create smaller shellfish throughout Maine. When I first learned about the effects, of, uh, the effects we were having on our oceans, I felt extremely small. I was constantly hearing it's your generation's task to fist this job. However, through education from my high school and middle school and many conversations with friends, I've realized that it's not just our job and it is the job of all of us. Yeah. It's going to take a lot more than just one generation to fix the problems that we've caused. CO2 is not gonna go away in a night and it is important to think globally but act locally. Our goal as a state should be to follow California's goal and to set a, a goal for 100% re renewability. In California, they've made their goal to be 2045. And as a state, we need to strive to reach, the Gulf of, to reach this goal in Maine by 2050. To reach this goal, we're gonna need to come together and work locally throughout Maine. All actions need to be taken, and no matter how small, it is important to remember that we can do this if we work together. Empowerment of others, like what is happening right now, will make this problem seem a lot smaller. Ocean acidification, or any of the other issues you will be hearing about today, will definitely seem less daunting if we continue our efforts to reduce our carbon footprint. With each step we are taking, we are gaining new information and becoming closer to reach our goal for a healthy and sustainable world with plenty of shellfish and fish to go around. Thank you. Next up, we have Ryan, and he's going to be talking to us about what the youth are doing. Yeah, yeah. In 1950, the world's population of 2.5 billion produced 1.5 million tons of plastic. 
In 2016, a population of more than 7 billion produced 320 million tons of plastic. This number is expected to double by the year 2034. When I first learned about this fact, I really questioned the validity of it. How can we as a society be living like this? The truth is, is that our society is an out of mind, out of, sorry, out of sight, out of mind society. The vast majority of us will never see the five enormous gyres of plastic floating in our oceans, killing millions of fish and ocean habitats. Habitats that millions of people worldwide depend on for food on a daily basis. We might never see the thousands of birds, whales, and turtles that are washing up on shores worldwide dead because, of they, because they have suffocated to death by mistakenly digesting plastic. But this will still continue to happen. Beyond the ocean, millions of tons of plastic are being burned every day in incinerators, leaving toxic chemicals floating in, the, in our atmosphere, directly linked to asthma and other respiratory diseases. We might never see this as well, but this will still continue to happen. The average American produces 4.4 pounds of trash daily, and roughly half of that is plastic waste. There's a small movement of people that are trying to cut plastic from their life entirely, but there's even a larger amount of people that are consuming more plastic with their products mindlessly every single day. I've come to the conclusion that the only real way to solve this issue is to blame those responsible. Corporations putting out more products packaged in single-use plastic need to be held accountable. <laughs> For far too long, the blame has been on the consumer, when in reality, all we need is more public spaces, restaurants, and grocery stores to phase out single-use plastic altogether. It is time for us to throw away this throwaway culture. It's time for us to value a livable and breathable future over our personal convenience. Dozens of high school students with the Maine Youth Environmental Association have taken this problem into their own hands. We've realized that our government has failed to properly address climate change, but we will not accept this reality. We're about to launch our 2018-2019 campaign to both educate hundreds of students in our schools about the harms of plastic and set real legislations in our communities and our state to phase out single-use plastics. The reality of the matter is that we literally do not have much time left. For those of you who can vote, we need voters to support the climate action advocates. For all students, we're building a movement in our state. We need artists, writers, speakers, organizers, fundraisers, and supporters. Our time is now. We must not waste any more of it. Um, and next, Raina Sparks, a junior from Cape Elizabeth. You know, I think recent events have made it seem like the United States government and climate activist organizers don't necessarily act in the same interest, which is probably true. What I love about democracy and grassroots organizing, though, is that they both have the same foundational message, and that is people power. Some of the greatest changes in American history, uh, whether they be suffrage, equal access to facilities, or reproductive rights have all come around because everyday people exercise their power to protest, to rally like we're doing right here, to file lawsuits. This empowered spirit is so evident in all of your faces down here, and it is foundational to the environmental movement. In 2015, 21 young people filed a lawsuit against the Oregon U.S. District called Juliana versus the United States. <laughs> the suit asserted that through ongoing actions to exploit natural resources and pollute the earth, the, the United States federal government has left young people to clean up a mess that was created before our time thereby destroying our constitutional rights to life, liberty, and property by the destroying the earth that is now ours. 
<laughs> the fossil fuel industry tried to involve themselves as defendants and joined the U.S. government in attempting to get the case dismissed. As time went on, the case moved through circuits of appeals, and in 2017, the Trump administration took drastic actions to take the case out of the public eye. He succeeded in moving the trial from February 5th to October 29th. However, the U.S. Supreme Court unanimously ruled in favor of the 21 defendants when he attempted to take further action against it. <laughs> have power even against massive industries and administrations like the fossil fuel industry or even the United States government. Even right here in Maine, our voices matter. In April of this year, thousands of concerned Mainers signed a petition to the Maine Department of Environmental Protection, which prompted them to introduce new rulemaking standards of lowering the acceptable levels of greenhouse gas emissions in our state. The enduring message here... <laughs> is that when we come together as citizens and as human beings, our ability to foster change has no limit. So what do we do now? How do we harness this power to create a better world for current and future generations? The answer is in showing our elected officials that their voters care and they are watching them. The answer is to send letters, phone calls, emails, petitions, urging them to support proposals for wind, solar, and wave energy. Make them modernize main building and electric codes. Make them modernize the main environmental state. When that doesn't work, create coalitions, canvas, phone bank, bring out the population to choose elected officials that care about main people. When we stand together, we are more powerful than any industry and any government, and we can make a difference. <laughs> Next up, we have Hunter Lachance. He's a sophomore at Cunnamunk High School. Hi, I'm Hunter Lachance, and I'm an asthmatic. I'm here to talk about asthma and its relationship to pollution and climate change. My life when I, with asthma started when I was in fourth grade. It changed everything. Asthma, asthma affected nearly every aspect of my life. It was difficult to come to terms that my life would never be the same. But I'm not alone. There are over six million kids around the U.S. with asthma. And Maine, has a highest rate of ch has some of the highest rates of children asthma than any other state, and since it is both disruptive and dis and distressing, they often miss school, limiting their ability to learn, and they also miss work, limiting their income. Over the years, I've learned the importance of keeping our air clean, for me and the sake of all other Mainers with a respiratory disease. While pollution doesn't cause asthma, it triggers attacks. On ozone alert days, Mainers everywhere have trouble breathing. We sit, at the, we sit at the end of America's tailpipe, making us more susceptible to pollution from other states. And Maine, since it has some of the highest rates of asthma in the nation, has a higher health risk than almost every other state. In addition, pollution triggering, in addition to pollution triggering asthma, and slowly poisoning Maine's environment, it also directly impacts climate change. Pollu pollution from cars and factories upwind also pollute carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. Climate change is one of Maine's biggest threats. Climate change is hurting our ecosystems, both in the ocean and land. Our lobsters are moving north with the changes in water temperatures. Our shellfish are under stress, and every day, the, the rate of Mainers getting sick from Lyme disease increases. However, there are solutions, like switching as fast as we can to an electric vehicle state. This one will greatly shift the pollution we cause as a state. By promoting eco-friendly products, we can reduce the carbon emissions of factories. We can also work to elect federal officials who will make every effort to create an up create and uphold clean air regulations.
All of this will greatly help me and all the other Mainers suffering from asthma, because everyone has a right to breathe clean air. I'd now like to introduce my classmate and good friend, Ruthie Metcalf. Hello. So I'm going to tackle the jobs part of climate jobs and justice. Um, so I would like to speak to you about the impact of a change to widespread green industries and clean energy would have for job opportunities in our state. Green and renewable energy hold incredible potential for Maine's future. Solar and wind power jobs alone would be able to employ thousands of people in our state with long, well-paying jobs that, cre that promise a cleaner future for the state of Maine's climate and economy. Not only would this jo provide jobs for us, but it would also create industries that would greatly change Maine's economy for the good. When we create jobs and work that provides money for our state, that stays in our state, we set ourselves up to prosper and grow. I grew up in Maine backyards, in Casco Bay summer camps, and close to our beautiful Atlantic coastline. This state is my home as it is yours. I believe because of this, we should be putting absolutely everything into the fight to obtain greener, more renewable energy solutions. We can do it. Wind energy is something we should be thriving off of, and it is a resource that we are completely underutilizing. The manufacturing of windmills alone could create hundreds of reliable and valuable jobs for Maine people, while being a clean and powerful form of green energy. Seven years ago in 2011, the governor shut down any prospect of floating solar panels at that time, at the same time letting fear dispose of an investment that could harness the strong winds off Maine's coast for clean energy and business for manufacturing and installment companies. We need to be pushing, we need to be pushing that items like these will no longer be shut down without our voices in the picture. We need to demand the change. Any any jobs created by a shift to renewable energy would be jobs for our brothers and future generations. They could be in almost every community and would range from any number of things. Solar panel installation, windmill manufacturing, business management, and an endless number of other jobs. These are jobs that need real people. A machine can't install a solar panel. A machine cannot replace these jobs. Maine has a once-in-a-generation opportunity to lead the way in energy innovation, create thousands of good jobs, build a strong statewide economy that works for all of us, increase our energy independence while reducing people's energy costs, and protect our quality of life. These jobs have enormous political power and can create any number of opportunities for our state to advance and thrive both economically and environmentally. I urge you to create and push policies that support and jumpstart a future of Maine fueled by renewable energy. If we do this, we will find the secure and well-paying jobs our state needs, our people need. Remember that this is not a partisan issue. It's about doing what is right for Maine's future and our future generations to come. I'd now like to introduce Luke Serica Flanders, a sophomore at Freiburg Academy. Hello. My name is Luke Sakara Flanders and I am a co-founder of Community Water Justice. I live in <laughs> I live in Freiburg, Maine, a frontline community where Nestle, the largest food and beverage corporation in the world, is privatizing our local water supply and shipping it all over the country under the label of their Poland Spring brand of <coughs> of bottled water. Here in Maine, we are greatly privileged to have access to an abundance of clean water. It is crucial that we stop taking this vital supply for granted, as we are already seeing drought in many regions of the world where water was once abundant. Many water sources are being destroyed and contaminated by industrial pollutants with a lack of accountability. As water exportations to these suffering regions become more common, multi-billion dollar corporations such as Nestle become the primary water transporters. Why? Certainly not out of the goodness of their hearts, but because it is highly profitable. Water is going to be the new oil. There are already violent conflicts across the globe because of water scarcity. 
In places like Lagos, Nigeria, people are paying up to half of their annual income on bottled water, resulting in serious health problems because it is their only option. This measure of profiteering is resulting in serious health problems for those who can't afford what should be a human right. So, what can we do? The best place to start is to stop buying bottled water. It is wasteful, and the commodification of such a vital resource will have lasting effects on human health. It's time that we start treating water with the respect it deserves as a human right and not a tool for financial exploits. As climate change affects the globe, it creates new stresses on formerly reliable water sources. These stresses on worldwide water supplies are spurring the consumption of bottled water, which in turn is driving the privatization of Maine's rich water resources. Corporate control of water sources will only exacerbate the problem because priority will go to those who can afford it. Here in Maine, Nestle is exploiting municipal water sources using its most profitable brand in the United States. Poland Spring. This struggle for water access is what brought me to where I am today, and I have invested seven years of my life in this issue so far. <laughs> Struggles over local water control will play a major role in overcoming corporations who prioritize profit over access to water. By slapping a price on the water that should be coming out of our taps, they are giving life on earth a monetary value. This system based on human exceptionalism is not good for any living thing on this planet. Our descendants will have to live with a lack of drinking water unless we take necessary steps to protect our future. My generation is in a position to steer America in a different direction. Don't buy bottled water unless it's an absolute emergency. Research and call out corporations that seek control of our water for private profit. If you'd like more information, visit Community Water Justice online or come talk to me anytime. Thank you. I want to thank you all again for coming out today. And I want to remind you that we've got a lot of work to do. So let's go back to our towns. So many towns around this state right now are demanding local action. Towns are springing up all over the place saying we're going 100% renewable. Go home and make sure your town's one of them. And, and most importantly, let's remember the midterm elections are coming right up. Get involved where you can. We have got to turn the tide. We cannot afford the polluters to be in control. Let's raise the voice of all these amazing youth and give them a future. And before you all go home, we got one more thing to do, and we got a little singing to do. And it's my pleasure to introduce Chuck Spanger, the main blend, and the leftist marching band. You have a handout that has the lyrics to the tune. It's called Song for the Climate. Uh, it is on the 350 website if you haven't uh, seen it. So you can really enjoy a treat there. There are four different versions sung by enormous crowds, European crowds, that are uh, quite fantastic. But we're going to do the best we can here and now.
do the song twice so you get the hang of it. for coming. It's been a really great uh, rally, and uh, Lee wants to say something. I just want to thank Peter Bradford, Jimmy Freeman, and folks from up Belfast Way who brought down the coffin and hauled it up and down Portland Street. Leftist marching band, can you rock us out of here? We'll leave to your dulcet tones.